direct from the Football Association with expert guidance, tips, insights and more for the grassroots football community with Tom Lee and Charlotte Richardson. This, this is In The Box. Hello and welcome to In The Box, a brand new podcast for the grassroots football community brought to you by the Football Association. I'm Tom Lee and for each episode I'll be joined by my co-host Charlotte Richardson. Yep, that's right. Here at In The Box, we are going to be bringing you expertise from people across the grassroots game, equipping you, developing you and looking to help you and your football clubs run. Tom, as this is our first episode, I think it's probably right that we introduce ourselves properly. Yeah, definitely, Charlotte. So do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and why you've ended up joining me on this podcast here? Yeah, of course. So I've always loved my football and started, like most of us, volunteering within the game. I started at a local women's football club, really interested in becoming a journalist. And somehow that led to looking after the social media channels, the website. And I then decided I wanted to work in marketing. So I got loads of experience volunteering. I then was recruited as a marketing and communications officer at my local county FA worked there for a number of years, again, servicing all elements of the grassroots game. And I then went to work within the Football League at an EFL club. And since then have worked here, there and everywhere across football, from the women's game, men's game, youth, disability football, you name it, I've given it a go. And I still volunteer to this day. I run a program called Eight Wonder, which uh, looks to get more women and girls into football in terms of jobs as opposed to playing. And I am also on the Kent Youth League Committee and an FA Club consultant working with you, Tom, to help look after clubs, league structures, to, to make sure that football is as accessible and, in, and enjoyable as it possibly can be. Can you tell listeners a bit about your role um, within the FA? Yeah, 100%. Shall I just want to say the amount that you're doing and what you're involved in is is really testament. So to actually have you here today is absolutely fantastic and fitting us in. So yeah, my role within the Football Association is to, as the title is, National Club Services Manager. Essentially what that means is that I, I've got knowledge across vast different amounts of different support and services on offer to clubs and leagues at all different levels of the game. So from National League system all the way down to your youngest team within grassroots. We've got that many different clubs of varying sizes across the country that they all need a different type of support and a different type of service. And my role is with our 50 strong county FA network to try and get them services out to those clubs and those leagues to make sure they're sustainable and built to last. So part of this role is getting to work with people like yourself, Charlotte, who's got vast knowledge and expertise within particular subjects, of course, of which yours has been marketing communications, and we've got other club consultants that have this knowledge and expertise as well. And this podcast is an opportunity for us to try and get that information out there so people can listen to it, find resources and come back to what is known as our grassroots hub. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about the Grassroots Club. You touched upon the FA Club consultants. I mean, we're going to have so much expertise shared, but this resource hub is also another avenue that, that people can access. Yeah, it's... It's one where we've looked at the landscape and obviously what's been happening with COVID and stuff recently, we've seen some really good engagement digitally. And what we want to be able to do is provide our knowledge, resources, expertise from people across the game, within the FA, outside of the FA, within the county FA, workforce, other stakeholders, capturing that content and putting it out there digitally so anyone can access it. So the hub essentially will just be a home where all these resources sit and fit. That sounds absolutely amazing. It goes without saying, if you are tuned in, if you are watching, we will put all the links that you require within our show notes so that if there's anything that pricks your interest or you want to find out more about, you'll be able to do so. Well, that's us in a nutshell. I think it's time that we crack on with the first episode of this brand new podcast, In The Box. And the topic picked itself. COVID-19, it's been a tough time for us all. It's been a tough time for football, for coaches, for volunteers, parents, players alike, hasn't it, Tom? Yeah, COVID-19, extremely hard. We saw obviously the end of last season take place in March and shutting down the season, which a big thank you to all the volunteers across the league and club landscape that took part in actually helping shut down a season. It by no means feat is that easy and it's unprecedented. We've never had to do anything like this before, so there was no blueprint for it. So we want to touch on COVID-19 because obviously it's impacting this season again. 
and we're going to look at funding, particularly what's out there, what's been available, what's on the horizon, is there any innovation that's taking place within the landscape that we can share with you. So we've got one of our club consultants coming on to speak about that. And then we're going to look at good engagement. Obviously, we've got Charlotte with us, expert within the marketing and communications world. So good engagement at a time like this. What can you use and utilise? There's a lot out there. There's a lot for us to break down, but we're doing our best to give it to you straight. You're listening to In The Box. COVID-19 has affected our lives in more ways than we could ever have anticipated. And since last March, that impact has been felt across grassroots football in ever-evolving and changing ways. So it feels appropriate that the first topic that we speak about on this episode of In The Box is to do with funding. Because, Tom, these are really, really tough times. Clubs are having to react continually to changes going on. But there is support there is funding and there is resource out there to help, isn't there? Yeah, there certainly is. I think we saw, especially after the first lockdown, significant support that obviously came from Government, Sport England, the Foundation, and pretty much them places that you mainly look at for that type of support, especially in these unprecedented times. So they really did step up and support clubs of all different levels with that type of support. But what we've got today is we've got a, one of our FA club consultants that we're going to welcome onto the line. And Steve's going to be able to just look at some different angles away from the particular, the, the typical grant funding and the opportunities that do lie out there because the money is there. But I'm going to welcome Steve onto the line. Steve's going to obviously chat us through about it because Steve is an expert in this area and he's got some really good examples that he's going to share with us. So welcome, Steve. Good afternoon. Steve, it's so great to have you on this podcast and on this episode. We've obviously worked together as FA club consultants. Right now, clubs, leagues and, and football organisations, they really kind of need that knowledge and expertise, don't they, to get through the, the tough months and to recover? Yeah, it's, it's about uh, all banding together and sharing expertise. The more you can share your expertise, the, the, the more you'll learn from each other. Peer support is important. I think that's what this hub and the start of this hub is certainly what we're trying to achieve with the FA driving, what we're, what we're classing as a, a connective and collaborative club and league network, making sure that the expertise and the experience that's out there is actually cascaded through the network because there's nothing better than a club that's got ambitions or they've got a question around some type of funding that they're after going after. There's someone that's already generally been there and done it and being able to connect the two whilst having yourselves as club consultants in your roles to actually help navigate that and bring that to life is a real opportunity. Uh, I, I found that uh, in football in general, we, we don't kick each other off the field of play. So if, you've, if, if you come across an idea somewhere and you ask another club for some help, the people in that club, generally speaking, can't do enough to help you and point in the right direction. And we need to harness that. Yeah, and I think that's a key driver, and I, I really like that, what you've said there, Steve. Obviously, on the pitch, we're going to be competitive. We're potentially playing in the same leagues. But off the pitch, we've really got to support each other in terms of our structures and our sustainability. Because if not, my team's not going to be able to play your team next week because I might no longer be in existence. Correct. Yeah, that's true. Um, we, I've, over the years, I've picked up loads of ideas just by having a chat in a boardroom with uh, fellow directors or on a grass pitch talking to parents about how they raise their, you know, raise their funding and you think, oh, that's a good idea. And then every idea doesn't work for everyone, but you can, you can pick, and, pick and choose what's available and then use that to your own advantage in your own particular club. And I love how that, that works, obviously. You've, you've potentially got two teams going at it on the pitch, but off the pitch you've got two club chairmen or the CEOs that are just stood having a cup of tea or coffee and just chatting through the potential opportunities that do lie in sharing that expertise. So Steve, coming up in February, we've got two particular webinars that are going to be focused around funding with yourself and two of our other fellow club consultants. And we're really going to start to focus in on some of the opportunities and the innovation that lies out there. And one of the terms that we really like to use at the FA and that we're trying to cascade out into the landscape is being fit for funding. 
I'm just wondering if you could spend a little bit of time elaborating on what we mean when we say a club or league being fit for funding. Yeah, um, there's a lot of resource out there that you can apply to, but you've, you've got to be in a position to be able to apply. What I mean by that is you need the correct club structure. There's nothing worse than filling a grant application in, um, spending hours and hours and hours and hours of time, and you get to the end and you find out, oh, you can't apply because you've not got charitable status. Um, that's just one example. There are other other examples there where there, you might do some research and find out there's a funding pot available um, and you, you want a new pitch, for example, and you apply for £100,000 when the grant application goes in and it's rejected on the grounds that you can only apply for up to £50,000 and you need match funding for the other fifty thousand. So it's knowing, it's doing your research and, and ensuring, first of all, that your club's fit for funding, but also reading the guidelines of any grant application to make sure that you, you, you know, you're able to apply. And we'll, what we'll do in the webinars is talk through some of the um, pitfalls that are available and give a few tips on how, as I say, using the term again, to get yourself in a position where you are fit to apply so yeah, exactly that's what the webinars will look for us to get into a bit more granular detail around structure. And obviously that incorporates governance and governance can in sometimes be a word that puts people off, can't you, Charlotte? Yeah, exactly that. Sometimes it can be quite intimidating. And I was going to ask you, Steve, for a lot of volunteers, they might not have a lot of experience in terms of putting applications together. Are there any resources or any tips that you can give someone who's maybe tuned in about exactly where to start? Well, some people use the term plagiarism. I use the term borrow with pride. And as I was saying right from the outset, if you speak to other clubs, invariably they'll share you. Um, they'll share an application with you. Um, you know, we, I've, had, I've had grant applications where we've had 10 grand here, 25 grand there. And clubs have rung me and said, how have you got that? And I can't wait to tell them, to be honest. It doesn't affect me. But what they do is they take my grant application and chew it around until it suits their purposes and off they go. And then they're successful. Definitely so. And on that note, Steve, you did share with me earlier, and I hope you don't mind bringing up the example with a team that had recently done very well in the FA Cup. You'd helped them a few seasons ago, a, a bit of governance restructuring that then really helped the club to, to generate income, which will ensure their sustainability for years and seasons to come, I imagine. Do you mind telling us a little bit more? Yeah, sure. I mean, one of my um, people, one of the clubs I work with is Marine Football Club. Uh, who have very recently been in the in in the in the news for obvious reasons? Um, I'm sure they won't mind me sharing this uh, experience with you. But about 18 months, two years ago, um, I started to work with them, and they wanted to go down the route of setting up a CIO, which is a charitable incorporated organisation, uh, a charity in effect to run run in tandem with the football club. Um, now, bear in mind, that was 18 months ago, and um, just recently, they played, obviously, Tottenham. Part and parcel of the, um, the day, the events on the day, was that they did a virtual ticket to the ground, and I think they sold 30,000 tickets in the region of that, they declared at the end of the day. But part of that, um, they offered, people, they said to people in, when they were, given their offer, would you like to support our local charity at the same time? And uh, a lot of people did. And I won't declare the figure to you because I don't think that's right to do so. But let's just say it ran into uh, five figures, went into the charity. It will now be used to support local people, local children, the junior teams, the girls' teams. And if Marine hadn't set that charity or that CIO 18 months ago, They'd have been a lot, a lot worse off from the charity point of view. Um, and I've, I've done similar things with other clubs across my league in the Northern Premier League, which I'm a director. Um, I've worked with uh, several clubs and set, helped them set up these CIOs. Uh, my own club, Ashton United in the Northern Premier League. For the last three, four years, I think we've had it in the region of 40k a year in just to support local initiatives and at the same time, the football club. 
Steve, that's absolutely fantastic. And it's just one example of, of what's possible if you get the right structures and the right governance in place. But obviously what we might have listening on, on this podcast and, and this, this series is people of clubs of all sizes. And obviously it's just being able to provide those smaller clubs, if you like, in, in the grassroots football with some, some key advice. And I guess one of the things that we spoke about offline the other day, Steve, was that identifying a need and an offer for that need before then actually seeking out a, a, the relevant grant application. Because I think what we found is that a lot of clubs and leagues will say, yes, we want money and we want funding. But it's understanding what the actual need is to then go after that funding and thinking of different other stakeholders, different other groups that could provide they satisfy that need. Yeah, the biggest mistake anybody makes is saying we want some we want some sponsorship or we want a grant for this. And then somebody says to them, uh, well, what do you want? And they don't know. So you've lost that opportunity. So the, the first thing you need to do is de define what it is you want, why you want it. Um, and it isn't all about bringing money in. It could be just, uh, you know, pulling in a favour somewhere. So it's important also to know who you've got in your organisation. If you know what what the parents of some of your children might do, you might have a managing director of a business somewhere, and you tap him up and he may have contacts in other businesses, so that's how you get a sponsorship in. Or you might have somebody... We, we did an exercise some years ago where um, the... I needed some warm-up tops for my uh, my team. The, the kit man said, oh, we, we've no money for what we... We need some warm-up tops to falling apart. I said, well, I haven't got any money. So I gave it some thought, take a step back. How can I get those warm-up tops without paying for them? And um, I'd seen an article in the local paper that the public health department wanted to uh, advertise the use of uh, for men to, to use condoms. So what we did is, is we um, I went to the public health department and said, look, the majority of people watching our game are young, are young men. Um, so you buy me a load of warm-up tops, I said, and uh, we'll, we'll promote that fact for you. And you can imagine when the players ran out with a picture of a condom on the back of the, sh the, back of the shirt, how much publicity we got for that. It went national. Uh, and it was just, it's just a one-off. But there's all sorts of ways in which you can, you, you can get what you want without actually spending pounds, shillings and pence. Great example there, Steve. But it's about connecting those dots and it's being able to have somebody within the club with a foresight sometimes just to be able to connect them dots, identifying the need. I think one of the things that we'll cover on the webinars of which you can find the information within the show notes to be sure to book on and join myself and Steve and other fellow club consultants is looking at how to do an audit of your club and looking at how to look at the members within your club and potential opportunities there, as well as looking at them other examples of innovation that's out there right now because one of the things that we've got to recognise is that for some clubs it's just the survival during this period and what it is they can do to actually come out the back of COVID-19 whereas others will be in a really good position with their reserves and their, their financial accounting. So Steve thanks ever so much for joining us today. Look forward to seeing you on the webinars in February so anyone listening be sure to book onto them. This this is in the box. So while funding's been key, especially at a time like this, so is keeping that grassroots community engaged. So that's from the coaches to the volunteers, the spectators, and of course, our players. Charlotte, you're an expert in this area. Can you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, thank you, Tom. I think one of the things when it comes to marketing and communications in, in football, sometimes it can be a little bit forgotten about, but actually having really good communications, it's absolutely massive for football clubs and, and for leagues, whether it's recruiting, um, recruiting players, recruiting volunteers, or it is attracting sponsors. If you do that part right, it really can help an organisation to run and be far, far more effective. And I think we've really noticed that in this crisis in COVID-19 because we haven't been able to go and see each other on a weekly basis and to enjoy the game we love, but we want to stay connected and we want to still feel part of an organisation. And and that's when your marketing and your comms can really, really help. And it doesn't have to be expensive and it doesn't have to be time consuming as well, which is sometimes a bit of a misconception. 
There was an example that I saw that really brought it to life was that obviously what's happened with COVID-19, a lot of people have been either placed on furlough or even been made redundant. And a club had been really proactive on their social media and they'd spoke about looking for volunteers at a time like now, if you're looking for a sense of purpose, etc. And because they'd put this out there, this, this particular individual had found this club and they said, they dived straight in and they was very proactive in getting involved and I think they actually became the COVID officer when we was asking for COVID officers at that time. And they said it felt like it gave them a real sense of purpose because it was giving something back at a time that was really challenging for them. Yeah, I think for all of us who volunteer, it's when you feel that you're a part of a wider purpose and marketing and communications, you don't have to be a professional, you don't have to be qualified to be able to get a grip of it, to learn more and to understand why it is so helpful. And I think, like I've, I've made some notes here, that it's really important to, to think about how marketing functions for your club. It's not just having a nice website. It's not just being really active on social media. It's, it's imperative to have a strategy with your marketing that accomplishes everything you're about as a football club or a league. Your provision might be to make sure that those within your league have a really fun experience on a Saturday or a Sunday so you can you can encompass that on your social media channels you can encompass that when you email your stakeholders you can do some fun campaigns on social media we're all spending a lot more time digitally now and I think that's important to pick up is is the trends I think we've all noticed it in in how we consume information and those digital channels are important social media is really important because it's a free and accessible tool that most of us can can use it's definitely one we can use and I, I know for myself it's one that i use to go for for news and also a little bit of entertainment but i also use it to be able to look at what's already taking place and what's out there and i think that's the real beauty of social media is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel so you might see some really good content or really good examples of leagues and clubs that do this really well and if you reach out to them they're more than likely to be able to share with you some of their top tips and aside to that, I'm sure there's loads of resources and stuff out there, Charlotte. Is there any that you can point us in the direction towards? Yeah, I think, again, when it comes to using social media effectively, you have to think about what it is that your team, your club or, or your league is looking to achieve. There's lots of different um, platforms out there. My one golden tip that I share all the time with volunteers is to not worry about having to be on every single channel because there's Facebook, there's Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, you name it. Each week there's probably a new channel. Just focus on the channels that serve your organisation the best and focus on doing those really, really well. And to help do that, I know one of the things that we are all a bit deprived of is time. And particularly if you're a volunteer, you're probably doing enough hours as it is. So I would recommend to people looking at some of the scheduling tools that you can get out there. Hootsuite is one of them. TweetDeck is another. Facebook has a, an appliance called Studio Creator. So you can schedule your, your posts. You can schedule your Instagram posts on there. So a, a tip to anyone who is that volunteer within their club responsible for social media, look at those scheduling tools because it takes a little bit of pressure off yourself. But also you can plan and coordinate campaigns. Something that I did as a volunteer on the Kent Youth League just before Christmas we wanted to run a campaign to engage with our players because we're a youth league, we're the biggest in the county and our players are missing their football. So we wanted to do something that would lift their spirits. It tied into the, the most wonderful time of the year. We had a little bit of budget. We worked with a local company and each day we did a digital advent calendar on our social media channels. 24 players were picked at random. We announced them on our social pages. Our club secretary then obviously had their information to um, be able to send them this this voucher and it was really really nice it got fantastic engagement on our social channels the players the parents the clubs I think they all felt really proud to be a part of the league and yes there was a cost to the vouchers but there's other ways of, of doing that as well like using social media to engage with your stakeholders and, and making the most of those scheduling tools so it doesn't feel like you're slaving away um, or, or being you know permanently attached to your mobile phone and Another key tip is just have fun with it. Social media shouldn't feel like a chore. It can be really fun. It can be really rewarding. And if you're getting that buzz when you're doing stuff for your club, your team or your league, keep doing that because when you get that buzz, you're, you're doing something right. 
great advice and obviously great what you did with the, the Kent Youth League there, Charlotte. And I think what we've seen, especially within that landscape, is that it's been key or a, a definitely a tool to help support player welfare, both physically and, and mentally. Obviously, we've seen it support people in terms of getting active whilst at home, whilst they can't go out and play. And we've also mm. seen it just then messages of support and those that, like you say, that the advent calendar, it's just that really good engagement piece that gives you a bit of a buzz whilst on there because we know that there's a lot of pros and cons to both social media and the different platforms that we can utilise. I think one of the final questions I want to ask you, Charlotte, is that whilst I've been talking to a few clubs in leagues of late, is that a lot of them have got some real concerns around either existing sponsorship or sponsors that they're going after, especially at a time like this. Obviously, social media is a really good tool for them to actually satisfy those concerns. Any other tips in that sort of space there? Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, like you mentioned there, it's important whenever you're doing anything within the digital sphere on social media to be responsible. And there's, again, lots within the FA's website about how to do that. But you asked me a question that I get asked so many times and um, I'm sure it's something we'll talk a lot more about on in the box but attracting sponsors it's a big big challenge and especially at the moment because traditional sponsorship methods advertising on the shirts pitch parameter boardings match day advertising they're not viable and they're not necessarily commanding the income that they used to do so one tip that I always give to people asking about how to use social media or digital marketing to attract, satisfy and retain sponsors is look at your analytics. And for anyone that doesn't know or hasn't heard of analytics before, every one of the social media platforms that we've mentioned on this podcast, your Facebooks, Twitter, Instagrams and so on, they provide you with free analytics. And analytics are the figures that you can use to measure the performance of your social media channel. So in the same way, when it comes to football, we will assess how a game's gone by, the number of goals we've scored, chances created, tackles made and so on. We can do the same with our social media channels. So if, I, if I've got enough time quickly, I'll run through three of the key terminology. So you have your reach, which is the number of unique exposed, exposed people to your content. You then have the impressions, which is the number of times your content is displayed to users. And then your engagement, and that's the number of people that are actively involved in your content. Each of those three things I've mentioned there, you can find out for your club. And that is useful when it comes to attracting and retaining sponsors, because you can go to those businesses with clear numbers. You're not guessing you're not estimating, you're presenting a really good case of, of why they should invest in your club. And it's really enticing. And it means that they have some metrics that that they can relate to. Figures are, figures are really important. And so your analytics, when it comes to money and when it comes to getting that income into your club, I would turn to them. I think one thing we'd just say on it to sort of end on the analytics is that don't be disheartened if you're just starting out on that journey, your analytics are low start to generate some content, look at what others are doing and then follow Charlotte's top tips there. What you'll find on In The Box and obviously within our support hub will be content previously delivered as well. Part of last year in the FA Club Consultants, we had Charlotte deliver a four part series around marketing. So be sure to go and check out that content to get some more top tips from Charlotte. It's, all, it's also important to mention that Clubs and leagues must follow safeguarding whilst online as they would as if they was offline. So be sure to go to the FA.com and check out the safeguarding pages there. For the best clubs and the best leagues in grassroots football, this is In The Box. You are listening to the very first episode of In The Box and at the start of the show we promised you amazing guests and we've got another one lined up for you now. I'm delighted to say Senior Operations Manager at the Football Association, Kent Football Association Council Member, a trustee of the Kent FA Football Foundation and a grassroots football coach as well joins us. It's Paul Dolan from the FA. Paul, thank you so much for coming on this show. Hi Charlotte, I hope you're well. It's great to be with you. Hi Paul, great to have you. Obviously holding all them roles, um, we've, we've just been talking about good engagement but you've been part of the team that's been pulling together the garden so no wonder because you've got great expertise and great knowledge across the game. Can you just tell us how that guidance has been pulled together and what the reception of that guidance has been like within the landscape? Yeah, thanks, Tom. I have to say it's been brilliant. And while 
everyone clearly wants to be playing and enjoying grassroots football. The main priority at all stages has been that we adhere to government guidance and ensure our participants remain safe. This all started with an unprecedented situation where we had to close off all grassroots football competitions in March last season. And that was no simple matter and our county FA did a brilliant job working with leagues to ensure that this was done in a fair and consistent manner and in line with the standard code of rules. There was of course no manual about how to do this. We've also had a severely disrupted 2020 to 21 season with the test and trace two lockdowns, pause in the game and the tier system, which we know has caused logistical problems for volunteers that run grassroots football uh, clubs and leagues. But I can honestly say that everyone has adapted to ensure participants remain safe. And this has been an incredible response. Of course, there's been frustrations, but uh, that's simply because we're all so passionate about grassroots football. I would also add that the FA and the county FAs have ensured that we continue to serve and lead the game throughout the pandemic. Uh, this has included three COVID-19 support grant schemes where £14 million has been distributed to grassroots clubs to help with pitch improvements, modifying clubhouses and match day preparations. My club certainly took advantage of all of these grants, which were quick and simple to apply for. When you outline it like that, it makes you realise the monumental effort and, and reaction to a completely unprecedented situation from both the FA and how that's filtered through to the county FAs. For the volunteers themselves, though, having to react to this situation, it's felt like football has been a real catalyst, actually, for local communities and bringing people together. What's impressed you most about grassroots football's response to this pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I think through adversity, people really do come together. Uh, and now more than ever, we've seen that in various areas of society. Um, you will have hopefully seen that the FA launched a Lion Hearts initiative, which aimed to pay homage to 23 really inspirational individuals who have gone above and beyond during the challenging time for the nation. Um, I mean, I've seen various examples from the grassroots football community. I know from my own club, uh, we've provided really good support for our players through online Zoom fitness uh, and skills-based sessions just to keep players engaged. And I know multiple clubs have been doing something similar. Um, I also recently saw a really good initiative that I liked where a county FA um, printed out homework for parents that were struggling to print out, out homework for their homeschooling um, for free. And I thought that was a really lovely gesture. So I think there's been so many examples of uh, great engagement during such troubled times. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. People, individuals, clubs, leagues going absolutely above and beyond. And maybe we'll include in the show notes as well, the link to that campaign you were, you were talking about, the Lion Hearts, because I noticed that one as well, and it was incredible. Um, as you mentioned earlier on, it's an ever-evolving, changing situation. Can you just bring us up to speed at this present time, what the latest guidance is for, for those within the grassroots game or where perhaps they can head if they need to find information? I think by now all stakeholders are aware and understand that all decisions on whether grassroots football can continue to be played are ultimately driven by the requirement for the FA to follow the latest government advice on COVID-19. Um, so as a reminder, we had four tier areas before we went into lockdown with various restrictions in, in place. And we know this caused plenty of issues with grassroots football being played across the tiers, which meant that in certain cases, it was just not feasible to continue playing. And when schools were shut in certain tier four areas, we know there was a real reluctance to keep playing. Clearly, the latest guidance is that fixtures and training for grassroots football in England, other than disability football, is currently suspended. Thanks, Paul. And obviously, with the vaccines being rolled out, there's, there's potentially some hope on the horizon for a, hopefully an undisrupted season next season. There's obviously some decisions to be made for this season and what football activity looks like, but definitely some positive news. If we're to direct or signpost anyone anywhere, Paul, where is it we can direct them to to find out the latest information? Yeah, the best places to go is to visit the FA.com, where all the latest information is posted and all the guidance documents are located. Uh, and please liaise with your local county FA for any support, advice and guidance you might need. 
some really clear advice to end on there. Paul, thank you so much for coming on In The Box and, and sharing an insight into how that reaction, that unified effort has been brought together. It's been really interesting and eye-opening. Brilliant, thanks, Paul. Thank you. This, this is In The Box. Well, that is just about all we have time for for episode one of In The Box. Thank you so much for joining us and a massive thank you as well to our amazing guests for sharing their expertise. It's been really, really interesting. I've certainly learned a lot. Tom, I'm sure you have as well. What can we expect in the next episode? Thanks, Shell. Yeah, on the next episode, we're going to take a look at the FA Charter Standard Club and League Accreditation. We're going to hear from some of those within the grassroots game that have lived and breathed it. And we're also going to do that alongside the power of football knowing no bounds oh there we go that sounds very very interesting don't forget if there is anything that you didn't quite make a note of in the podcast episode whether it be funding resources or covid regulation guidance we are going to put everything in the show notes for you and there's the resource hub all sorts isn't there tom for people to find the information that they need yeah there definitely is so we've got the fa.com forward slash clubs and leagues for people to go to. We've also got the two webinars taking place during February, so be sure to go and sign up for those if you're interested in the funding aspects of things. And then, of course, we'd love to hear from you. We want to know what topics you want us to talk about. We want to get the relevant people onto these podcasts. So make sure your email is at clubsprogram at the fa.com. Yeah, it'd be fantastic to hear from you. This is the show for the grassroots football community. If we can help you navigate your way through these tough times, then that would be brilliant. I'm looking forward to the next episode already where we will learn and find out even more whilst shining a very deserved spotlight on the amazing volunteers doing so much for our game right now. Yeah, we look forward to seeing you on the next episode with myself and Charlotte. Stay safe and take care of everyone. See you later, everyone.